Welcome everybody to the first of our free webinars where we're giving a taster of some of the content at our UK Lean Summit. Uh, my name is Dave Brunt and I manage the activities at the Lean Enterprise Academy and I'm joined by one of our senior Lean coaches Peter Watkins and by our guest Neil Trivedy today. Um, just a reminder, um, LEA is a not-for-profit um, it was set up by Dan Jones over 20 years ago to help customers become self-reliant on their lean journey. Do take a look at the website. It explains our history, what we're researching, how we work with partner companies using the lean transformation framework and all our learning, teaching and coaching and sharing activities. Um, the summit is our conference that we developed to help people learning and implementing lean thinking. It's a key in-person activity that helps um, delegates by sharing how Lean can be used to solve the problems of today and tomorrow whilst enabling participants to build their own network of Lean thinkers. Today's subject is one of four key themes for the 2023 event, the others being the productivity challenge, supply chain disruption and lessons learned from COVID-19. Um, there are both keynotes, uh, plenary sessions and also learning sessions which you can tailor to your agenda. There are over 30 speakers from 15 companies, including the Aramis Group, Iberia Airlines, Securus Vaccines, uh, Strategy Deployment, the NHS, uh, Thales, which is a big uh, Anglo-French um, defence organisation, uh, Technip FMC, obviously Ecobat that Neil will be talking about today, and of course, Toyota. Uh, we're told it's the best event of its kind, and it regularly attracts a diverse audience. The last event had over 160 representatives from 22 countries. OK, so uh, I'd just like uh, to introduce Neil quickly. Uh, Neil has been applying lean thinking and practice all his career. I've known him for quite a long time now, too long, probably. But uh, he's uh, practiced uh, lean thinking and practice in uh, Royal Mail, Mars and where I met him in GKN. And uh, that's where he first started to develop his uh, thinking and practice on approach around lean and green. And he worked uh, with a lady called Andrea Pampanelli from the uh, Brazilian manufacturing plants in GKN. And the outcome of that uh, kind of learning was uh, first written up in one of the first books, I think it was on the uh, green factory, uh, which you can get. And uh, now Neil runs his own company and has supported many organisations on their lean and green journey, which uh, he'll no doubt uh, explain some of that today. So uh, the first question we're going to ask Neil uh, in this session really is uh, really want to solve the mystery of uh, what is lean and green. So Neil, over to you. Um, yeah, as you said, something we developed um, with Andrea down in Brazil. She's uh, or was then the uh, environmental manager. Uh, and, you know, it's what her passion is, you know, environment and improving the environment. Uh, I went down there and trained her in, in lean, uh, you know, in the GKM way, as we did um, many years ago. I think it was probably 2008, I think uh, it started. Uh, and then once she'd completed the training and uh, implemented quite a lot of what we discussed, uh, she came back to me and said she wanted to join her two passions together, lean and green. Uh, and she wanted to do a PhD in it. So... Um, you know, we started on that journey. I was coaching and supporting her to develop that with um, Cardiff University and the uh, university in Porto Alegre in Brazil, where she is, um, to bring that together. So in due course, you know, we did a lot of um, Kaizans and experiments, as you do in any kind of scientific uh, uh, approach or in any PhD. Um, Andrea read all the papers, thankfully, uh, the hundreds of them that you have to do when you're doing a PhD. Uh, and then dutifully, she completed a uh, PhD, which was brilliant. Uh, and me being a manager and, um, uh, you know, thinking about what I wanted to do as an objective in life, um, I didn't have that. But coaching someone to get their PhD, I thought was pretty good. So I was quite happy with that. Uh, and for me, that was the end of the story uh, until about a month later when she rang me up and then declared that um, we needed to write, write a book on it, which is what I'd promised her, apparently, somewhere in Brazil. Um, so then we started on the journey of the book, really, to bring to life uh, what her PhD was. Obviously, slimmed down and more practical, so it's a bit more, um, you know, a bit more digestible uh, for people. So that's kind of the background. Uh, it took us a little while to publish it, and we, we, you know, got together with Pauline as well to help us with that process, who was one of the professors um, who supported uh, Andrea during that time. But basically what it does, it 
brings together um, lean and green thinking. And that's the journey we took from lean to green. Uh, and that's important. And I'll come back to that later on. And what we found was that where you've got kind of a good deployment of lean, where all the basic tools are in place, things like, you know, 5S, TPM, total productive maintenance, lost time analysis, visual management, tiered meetings, problem solving, and so on. Um, and it's not just on the shop floor, but you've got leadership involved. You know, you've got it in the office as well. Um, so that it's, you know, all and everywhere and it's sustained within the organization, then, you know, very successfully, you can actually add green thinking on. And that's really about examining, um, you know, uh, what you're doing and reducing the environmental impact of whatever it is. Um, so it's very uh, holistic in that approach that you, and you can apply those principles, not only to the factory, but but kind of everywhere, really. Uh, and what we did was really map a pathway to convert kind of uh, a good deployment of lean to a good deployment of lean and green. And that's what really the book's about. And that's the background um, to, you know, kind of today, really. OK, great. Thanks for that. So but what are the problems of today uh, that, that drive that green and manufacturing approach? Yes. So it's interesting you say that, actually, Peter, because, um, you know, I mentioned this was a lean to green approach. But what we've got now is a far more far more pressures on the green side of things, as it were. You know, people want to be greener. Uh, and we've also got, you know, the immense, you know, power increase cost that we've uh, seen recently as well. So originally we had a triangle of, you know, the people, the planet and the profit, you know. And so you work through the people, you know, uh, you motivate them to improve the planet. And a happy byproduct for most companies is you increase the profit. Um, so that really drove the deployment originally. Um, but, you know, the exponential rise in energy now has, has changed that to really convert it to a green to lean approach. So I'm getting, you know, I'm having conversations now where people haven't done lean, but are more interested sort of in the green aspect, but clearly the profit aspect of reducing their energy uh, use. Um, so as a result of the energy costs, we're actually getting, you know, more um, more interest in the green side as well uh, with that. I mean, there are a lot of pressures on companies at the moment. Obviously, we you know, started off with Brexit and we've got um, you know, inflation now. Uh, we've got supply chain issues caused by Brexit as well. Um, and then you know, in the background, we have COP26 as well in Glasgow, which again motivated people to get, get themselves kind of um, get green on the agenda of their, you know, of their annual reports. And I guess the next stage now is to make those, you know, those uh, nice pages in the annual report live in the organization. OK, well, you've talked a lot about uh, sort of green manufacturing and fact, uh, factory application and green thinking, but how, how does it apply to the service industries and the office environment, you think? Yeah, so I mean, the main difference from kind of a green perspective between the office and the factory is that in the factory, you use a lot more resources. You know, you have raw materials, you have gas, you have power, you have air, you have water and, and so on. You know, maybe many other things. And typically, you know, in the office, you know, basically it's just power and a bit of water and you might generate some, you know, recycling or, or rubbish, depending on how how good you are uh, with that. But having said that, you know, the principles apply you know, directly in the office. You know, you can apply them uh, just as much in the office to reduce, you know, your environmental impact. You might need a slightly different approach um, because, you know, the waste aren't as obvious, um, you know. So one thing, uh, for example, I'd recommend anyone to do is do what I call skip diving. So empty the bins and find out what you're throwing away. But don't just empty the bins full of rubbish, empty the recycling bins to make sure you're segregating correctly uh, and so on. Uh, you know, so there's certainly ways to, uh, to get into the office. The other thing, you know, the obvious big hitters are things like heating and lighting, you know, because you see and feel that. And it's also in many ways just like home. But then there are, you know, other hidden areas that you might not think about, you know, things like server rooms that require a lot of power and they also generate a lot of heat. So can you use that heat, for example, you know, to um, heat the office rather than, you know, uh, heating it separately with that as well? The other thing in the office, we've got to recognise that a lot of processes in the office determine what's going on in the factory. You know, so the purchasing decisions, uh, for example, of what you buy and how you buy it, and um, you know, all add or can take away from the environmental footprint from your products or services. Um, so that's another thing to to think about. Um, 
even um, things like packaging, you know, and returnable packaging, they're all areas that um, in terms of a factory, we, those decisions we make in the office, um, you know, I saw a really good idea from one furniture firm, they adapted their vehicles um, so that rather than cover their uh, sofas in, you know, polystyrene and cardboard, they can actually bolt down their sofas to the bottom of the vehicle. And so they got rid of, you know, all their packaging, you know, at an instant. So they don't have to buy it and they don't have to recycle it. Um, and it's a lot, it, it takes less time to actually deliver that item to their customer. You don't have to unwrap it uh, as well. So for sure, for sure, there's opportunities, you know, in the office and also the service industry. Um, you know, you've just got to look a little bit differently with it as well. OK, so, uh, you know, companies are pursuing lean and green, but um, what are the benefits of taking that approach to lean and green for organisations? So I think if you add it onto your lean journey, you've got, kind of got ready made employee engagement and involvement and some of the check systems that you need in place. So things like leadership standard work, uh, things like daily meetings, um, and indeed, you know, one of my clients now um, who've got high energy use, their daily meetings are just going to be solely focused on their operations that impact their energy use, you know, to really put a, uh, a spotlight on that area. So having that red, readily made um, structure and then extending into green and asking this, the continuous improvement questions around, you know, uh, the resources that you're using uh, re really help. Um, the next thing really is direct cost savings. You know, there's no waiting for the cost savings. If you're not using something, be it power, gas, a raw material, um, you know, you're going to save it straight away on your bottom line. So there's a direct effect. And, you know, we say with lean, the operational benefits you get first and the financial benefits come last. But, you know, when you take the green approach, if you're not using it, you're not paying for it. Typically as well, the nastier something is to the environment, the more expensive it is. So if you substitute a chemical, say, for, for water, for example, um, you know, you can see the impact on the environment, but also cost wise, it's significantly cheaper as well. Um, you may also get sort of indirect cost savings as well. So if you've got heat exchangers in place, you know, you, you, you're using it in one area to heat somewhere else, for example. Um, so that's a, a kind of a good sort of um, uh, balance, but also things like reducing, um, you know, rubbish, you know, so if you reduce waste going out the factory, you'll reduce your landfill cost as well as a, as a consequence with that. Um, you know, going down the green route as well engages employees, um, you know, people have got a, a lot stronger environmental conscience with everything that's going on uh, in the world. You can only see the the summer we had, which hit 40 degrees in places, uh, for people to realise that the world is changing uh, in that respect. So, um, you know, employees actually come to work now and to a large degree expect it to be green as well. Now, is that something a differential for an organisation uh, or is it just keeping up the question? Um, and yeah, as I said, it's very much now, um, you know, green to lean. Green's the way people want to go uh, and lean is a good tool to almost to add on to it uh, with that. So inversely now, it's um, a new way to deploy lean, really. Great, OK. So in that deployment, though, there's going to be challenges for organisations, isn't there? What, uh, you know, can you give us some examples of those uh, challenges and what typically they are? Yeah, I mean, if you put change into any organisation, you kind of will get resistance. And so, you know, this suffers from, um, none that suffer, but you're going to experience the same kind of uh, issues. You know, um, one client I've got at the moment, you know, one site, maybe after the third or fourth conversation, accepted that there needs to be a change. Um, another site denied it completely and said it's all the others that were using all the power up and causing the cost for the business. Um, so you have to think about it in a little way as a, as a kind of a bit of a change program as well to get people aware. So communicating not only, you know, to the employees, um, but also the other people involved in that organisation, you know, the customers, the users, for example, um, uh, things like that. The other thing as well, like any new objective, you've got to make sure that kind of golden thread of objectives goes through the organisation. Um, at one place I went to, um, you know, I got told I was adding another objective, another piece of work to do for them to do, you know, rather than 
uh, helping them with their objectives. Um, so clearly sort of agreeing that up front and getting that top down and making it one of those uh, you know, objectives that are deployed through the organization uh, is clear. Then on the other side, you know, once you've implemented, this is where the lean tools come in. You need the check act, which is, you know, and the coaching, which is where leadership standard work comes in, I think, uh, with that. So, you know, a lot of the coaching you have to do in facilitation is all about getting around those challenges. But what I'd say is those challenges in a lot of ways aren't um, any different uh, to any other kind of change initiative. One thing with uh, a lot of the uh, environmental information now it is data rich, you know, so you can get after the data quite easily. Um, if you think about at home, you know, a lot of the power suppliers, you know, they'll give you an app and they'll tell you almost half hourly use, you know. Um, so it is now a lot more readily available, which does then make, you know, analysis and decision making um, a lot easier with that. Do you think that gets to the employees? Are they aware if they're kind of winning or losing with that, you know, energy and materials and things like that? Well, that's um, exactly the reason why one of the one of the lean tools, the daily meeting process, uh, for example, is a great way to to visualize, uh, share that, and then you know people to look to see how they can improve it. Um, and you know, one organization, that's the way I've gone. And multi-site is to get them every day, every morning to talk about you know their previous twenty four hours energy use. You know, is it at the target? Is it above, below? Um, and if it's you know way above, you know what's caused that? Yeah. Um, then once they've got it to a stable standard, you know, what can they do to actually improve it? Yeah. OK. So once you've you know tried to deploy this, what kind of results would you expect from from it? You know, what are the typical things you'll, you'll get? Um, it's quite, quite significant. There's one site I worked with. We managed to get zero to landfill, for example. Um, they had that kind of holistic target that they wanted to reach and they kind of went for it, uh, as it were. I mean, the results depend a lot as well on, you know, what you use. So clearly in manufacturing, there's a bigger opportunity because, you know, as we call it, environmental aspect use is a lot higher uh, in that respect. Um, I mean, just going back to the research we did in the book, uh, we averaged between 30 and 50 percent in the pilot cells um, reduction in kind of environmental use. And of course, it depends as well how wasteful you are in that respect um, uh, as well. So. Um, the interesting thing in the pilots was that what we call the sister cells, which are the mirror cells of the ones we tried, uh, which we deployed the pilot on, uh, actually um, had less of a saving on it. Uh, and what, what actually happened there was um, people were copying what we'd done on the first cell um, because they wanted some of it as well. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the other thing that happens is the culture change permeates the organisation um, all the way through. Um, you know, and I think now in some of the work I've done recently, you know, uh, those savings levels, I think, are, you know, achievable, um, especially when you look at it sort of with the, the green eyes, as I call it now. It sounds a great way to get people more engaged, isn't it? And, you know, making really practical improvements to their work environment on it. Yeah. OK, well, look, thanks, Neil. Look, I know today we're only having a bit of a taster, really. I know in your workshop in the summit, you're going to be you know, talking in more detail and giving some examples about how you do this and uh, showing uh, some of the, the companies that you've uh, worked with. So I think what, what we're going to do now is open it up to the audience and see if they've got some questions uh, for you uh, on the, uh, the lean and green approach. Yeah. And also what you'll be talking about at the summit. Yeah. So over if uh, we're going to open mic it now. So if anybody's got questions, I'm sure, John, you've probably got a good question to ask Neil. Yeah, well, OK. Uh, yes, Neil, I think uh, probably two big areas uh, that uh, uh, I'm not sure whether you've touched on them. But anyway, it, uh, of course, is design, uh, uh, product design and uh, and service design and also supply chain. So the supply chain uh, both on uh, on inboard, in, on inward and also uh, outward, so delivery and so on. So I, I think there's there's a big potential in both those uh, areas, so uh, design and supply chain. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I've got one um, client who are going to be moving into a new factory shortly. So, um, uh, you know, the product is, you know, it's kind of fixed, but the, you know, the manufacturing process and actual building that they're constructing, you know, has been very well designed to be, 
you know, to use the, the minimal amount of energy on a kind of site level. Um, uh, can't sort of say the same about its location uh, because, you know, that has been driven by other factors, namely local subsidies um, to build the factory there. Uh, but for sure, you know, designing products for, for, for green and understanding the manufacturing process, I think, is the next stage because it's not something, you know, people have ever thought of. Uh, and it's people are just starting to think about that just just now, really. Yeah, yeah it's a good it's a good one, Neil. I remember uh, we, we've been working at a facilities management company and they be were looking at their cl cleaning liquids. Yeah. And they'd not really challenged that before, you know, so they were doing some experiments about, you know, what could they use that's more environmentally friendly? You know, could it be water and things like that and testing things out and really challenging why do we have to use these, you know, uh these these caustic liquids yeah which are not safe as well for people yeah so yeah i think we can challenge you know even on the service environment on that yeah okay so has anybody else got any other questions for neil we'll open mic now hmm. Hello. neil th this is mike maxson sorry neil if 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 I were to approach a, a, a company or something like that, and, I, and I'm going to implement lean, you know, and, and, and maybe they've done some stuff before the typical 5S, maybe some other stuff, standard work and things, but I haven't looked at it from a, from a, from a higher level approach, being that trying to, trying to meet customers' demand, obviously, tact, you know, and, it, and it's an easier conversation to have with them from a lean perspective because now you're resourcing it, now you're giving them objectives and stuff. How do you approach a company and say, hey, we can make savings in lean? Is there, a, is there an approach there that a, a technique that's equivalent to developing your tax so you resource against what the customer's demand rate is? Or do you have ex, you know, just experience saying, hey, well, you should save 30 to 50 percent? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the evidence that we, we got together for, you know, Andrea's um, PhD in the book was, you know, the 30 to 50 percent thing. And that's where it comes from. I mean, essentially, you know, you have to look at it and it's kind of an e-value stream, we call it. So an environmental value stream is what you need to create to understand, you know, what are all the inputs environmentally and all the outputs environmentally. Uh, draw that picture for, you know, either the cell, uh, the value stream, the factory or your whole supply chain. Um, you know, to understand, you know, what's going on. Once you know what's happening uh, in terms of, you know, the data, say you use, you know, X kilowatts of energy to make this part, you know, see where it goes uh, and see what gets wasted uh, out of it. You know, so how much heat does the machine produce that isn't part of the, the product that, you you know, you want to see at the end? Um, and then you, you know, you, you, you get after what can you do to, you know, eliminate a task, um, reduce you know recycle uh, and so on so a great example of that is you know just simple drilling you know uh, so there's one factory you know we converted them from um you know wet um lubricant so you know kind of a water oil mix that you you have um down to dry machining you know so we use air pressure air to cool the part to cool the the drill and what you're doing there is looking you know what functionality you know, you're trying to achieve there with the coolant and it's cooling, you know, and, you know, removing some of the swarf. What could achieve that, um, you know, is high pressure air. And that's what they went to. So you don't have to buy the, uh, yeah, the coolant. You don't have to get rid of it. And also from a health and safety perspective, because typically it's a, an irritant, um, you know, you've got a health and safety, you know, benefit as well, which we, you know, hadn't really explored fully you know, at the time. So there's kind of a lot of happiness along the tree because the finance is happy because you're not buying it. The environmental manager is happy because you're not getting rid of it. And the operator is happy because he's got air and not oil and water sprayed all over his face when he opens the door uh, of the machine. Um, but yeah, so the, the key thing is to sort of take the value stream approach, but create what we call an E value stream uh, to understand uh, kind of what's going on really from an environmental perspective. OK, well, well, Neil, yeah, we're running out of time now, but uh, if you just want to uh, just quickly say what's going to be in your workshop yeah, in the Lean Summit, what you'll be discussing. Yeah, for sure. So uh, Ecobat, they're a lead acid battery recycling company, so um, really uh, lovely materials to deal with, um, hard plastic, sulfuric acid and lead. So some of the most uh, uh, gorgeous products you could ever think of, but Lead is the most highly recycled uh, metal in the world. 
uh, and it does make car batteries as well, which we need a lot of. Um, so really, one of the things I did with Ecobat was to actually train up, um, you know, 11 CI leaders, not only in lean, but lean and green, because I can imagine, you know, for their refineries, they're very high energy use um, and not just power, but gas, water, and also on the chemical side as well, a lot of reactants they use. So um, huge opportunity for that organization. And it's really describing that journey uh, in terms of, um, you know, what, what we did and also what we achieved. Uh, John was actually, John Manning, who'll be partnering with, um, he was actually on one of those trainees as a CI leader for one of the plants. Um, and now he's the UK MD. So that speaks, uh, uh, you know, uh, tenfold about, you know, what is achieved, but also what we've achieved through this approach. And he'll be describing the benefits and the inside view um, of, of that, that journey. Great. OK, well, thank you, Neil. I yeah, really appreciate uh, your time today and explaining that. Hopefully people come along and listen to you in your workshop. So over to Dave to right. wrap up. Thank OK, thanks. Uh, e excellent. You, you've really got me really got me thinking about all sorts of stuff there, Neil, uh, as you were, as you were chatting. So that was a taster. Um, and if it's got you thinking about the summit um, and that the, that the summit will be useful for you, here's some key information. Um, on Monday 17th, we've got pre-summit masterclasses. These are half day sessions around particular topic areas. Uh, for example, the lean transformation framework, problem solving, building a lean management system and Kaizen. Tuesday and Wednesday are the summit days. Uh, the event's being held in Liverpool. Um, there's an evening event as well uh, where we're, we're going to the Beatles uh, Museum in the evening. So uh, lots of opportunity for people to network. And um, this is a stop press, really, a stop press moment. Uh, I visited Toyota on Monday uh, to finalise a half day visit to the D-side engine plant. The idea is to build upon Toyota's keynote and learning session that they are doing on the Wednesday, uh, which is titled uh, How to Develop a Kaizen Spirit. Um, it's a bespoke visit designed for us. Uh, interestingly, actually, it very much links to this uh, lean and green piece. One of the things that we were looking at on Monday is the use in the plant of Karakuri Kaizen. Uh, that's that's Toyota's um, implementation of doing Kaizen that replaces, does away with uh, things that require energy. Um, so there's an environmental link to the issues there. OK, Luke, next one. OK, and then just as an ad, uh, a final ad, you may be interested in um, our online learning platform. We've got a range of materials on there including free and paid courses, on-demand webinars and learning materials. Um, you can either purchase those individually or you can uh, subscribe annually uh, to the platform to gain access to all the materials. There's over 20 courses on there now. Uh, we're adding more materials each month and obviously being not for profit, uh, we use the revenue uh, from the summit and from other things that we do uh, to make um, to make the platform better and to make the uh, materials accessible to everybody so that you can learn for yourselves how to create and deliver value better, faster and cheaper wherever, uh, whatever industry you're in. OK, so. Um, uh, if you want any more information on any of that, just just send us an email or uh, or take a look on the on the website online. Uh, the next webinar topic is practical cases for introducing Kaizen. Uh, that's on the 16th of February, where we'll be joined by lean coach and author Sharon Visser. So I hope you found this really useful. Um, and uh, if you want to stay on a little bit um, uh, longer and have a chat about any of the stuff that we've covered, um we'd look forward to hearing from you thanks very much okay thank you visit our website www.leanuk.org or contact us at info@leanuk.org at for any other information or how we can support you on your lean learning journey and don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel for the latest lean content